Fast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble, on TikTok at RedRock underscore Beeble, on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball and on Substack at joshlloyd48.substack.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you for making actually Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Enough of that. Happy Thanksgiving to all of those guys over in the U.S. that are celebrating Thanksgiving. Um, if you are in the U.S. and celebrating Thanksgiving, thank you for ripping your attention away from watching the Detroit Lions or talking to your family or eating or whatever it is you're doing because me and Adam King are here to answer your questions about fantasy basketball. Kingy, welcome back. Uh, morning, mate. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Nothing for us other than a day of no basketball. Happy Happy Friday and time for me to go get a haircut is what today is for me. So I'm look, looking forward to going and getting that done. Um, but yeah, we obviously don't celebrate Thanksgiving here, but yeah, we just don't have basketball on. We just had to deal with a big day yesterday and a big day tomorrow, but we are here live to see what questions you guys have. And uh, surprises actually anyone in here, to be honest, because most of the time on Thanksgiving, people are too busy doing stuff with their family. But hey, We've got stuff that we've got to talk about. We've got questions that you guys are going to ask. So we might as well just get straight into it. All right, Kingy. Paolo Nora says, is Keegan Murray worth picking up despite currently hitting the rookie wall? Oh, I'd like to say yes. Uh, I think he turns it around. It's been pretty rough. I've got him in a couple of teams and, and I have looked at the waiver wire to see if anyone else jumps out. Uh, but I, I'm holding him, so I... Yeah, I think he is. I mean, we saw at the beginning of the season what he can do. Uh, so so I like to think he'll turn it around at some point. I expect he'll turn it around at some point, but I'm not convinced that a turnaround actually means sitting through this sort of nonsense to wait for it. Like, is he, yeah, in contrast to, say, Jabari Smith, who, by the way, is now back inside the top 120 over the last two weeks, despite everyone's hand-wringing, um, yeah, I think Smith's game is a lot better and the minutes and role are a lot more secure, whereas Murray... He's struggling with a lot of things, back injury, the, the issue with his grandmother, um, and the fact that he's adjusting to not only being <clears throat> the fourth option on team, but the fifth option in that starting group. And as I said so much with him coming out of college, he was an older player, so beat up on the younger guys, which is something I always am a little bit cautious of, but everything was funneled through him. Like He was the guy that was doing everything on that team in, in his sophomore season, and he just wasn't going to have that opportunity here. So I do think he will improve, and I do think he'll be solid, but it might not be till January or February. And I don't know whether the actual return on that, like, do you think there's a chance, Kingy, that he can put together a top 50 stretch like or top 70 stretch? I don't. I think when he turns around, he might be the 100th best player. And I don't know if that's worth waiting for. Yeah, top 50, top 70, I don't think. Top 100, maybe. And I think we have to factor in that, that the Kings look like they're going to compete or they want to compete. And so it's not like the Rockets where they can just yeah. play these young guys. The Kings, I mean, they, they would give anything to make the playoffs. You would assume. Oh, they, so, they already they already have given it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they already have given anything. And Tyrese Halliburton, shout out to him. Yeah. Um, is it Justin? I don't know what the point of this question is, but I'm going to answer it anyway. What are my honest thoughts of Demar Derozan? I'm only going to give you my dishonest thoughts. Um, on him, I'm going to lie through my teeth about Demar Derozan. What I am going to say is that he has been good again, and somehow he's improved his two point percentage from last season, and he's taking threes. He's really solid. The Bulls rely... If they didn't have him, like they'd be, they'd be even more screwed than they are. Where are you viewing DeMar's rest of season outlooking? Uh, I, well, honestly, I don't even have him in any of my teams. So I don't... I know he's been pretty good. I think the fact Lonzo's not there, that helps him a lot because he has the ball in his hands a bit more. Uh, Zach Levine's been pretty ordinary. Uh, I've got I've got him in a couple of spots. Mm -hmm. So yeah, look, I mean he he's been really good. Again, you probably what he was going at around pick fifty, probably forty something like that, forty five. Uh, so yeah, I think probably where he is now is a is a sell a bit of a sell high. But we saw him do this last season as well. So I I'd just be yeah. holding on to him and enjoying it. Exactly, uh, Dennis Tran. Back to the Kings. How long can Kevin Herter sustain his current production? 
I know it's a hard question to answer, but more just a general discussion, I guess, on Herder. Uh, look, I mean, he's, he's uh, we touched on the Kings there, how good they've been, and he's been a big reason for that. Uh, I don't know. I think he's he's going to be a huge part of what they do moving forward. I think he's probably top 110 the rest of the way, top 100, top 110. Uh, no idea where he is now, but let's have a look. He's like 70th, maybe? Something around yeah. something around that mark, I would say? Yeah, I think this is probably probably a high point then for him. I don't think he can get much better than where he is. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I think, as I said, top 100, I think he's, he's definitely within reach. I think, I think I've got him just outside the top 100. And I've said this, I've said this a lot on Basketball Monster as well about Herder. He's playing well and people go, man, you need to bump his rankings up. But he's shooting 50% from three and I 100% guarantee it's not going to get better from there. Like it, it might be 40, it might be 41 and that's still awesome, right? But it's not 50. And that is his number one thing that's, that's helping him because it's many more points, it's many more threes, it's meaning a bump in field goal percentage. And then if that levels off to make it 40%, that means he's going to have a stretch where he shoots 34% or 35%. Um, he's just not going to continue. He's, he's a good shooter. He's, he's a good shooter. He's not. No one's a 50% shooter. So can he maintain his current production? 100% no. Absolutely not. There is no chance in hell that he maintains what he's doing. I guarantee you that he will not remain a 50% three-point shooter for the rest of the season. Now, not to say he's going to be bad or he's going to be a droppable player, but I 100% guarantee you, 99.99, I'll give myself an out, I guarantee you he will not continue this. Like it just, It's just not going to happen. How long he can do it? No one, no one knows, mate. Absolutely no way of knowing that. It could, it, he shot 42% yesterday from three, so did the drop-off start? I don't know. But... Yeah, it's not going to stick. I know that much. Um, always get questions on Jalen Suggs, so let's do another one. Seth says, what's Suggs' upside the rest of the season? Uh, I like Suggs. I mean, I've liked him since since draft day. Uh, he's Those injuries were a bit frustrating. He turns the ball over a bit. His efficiency's not great, but I think if you drafted him, you expected that. I, I think he's... I mean, he's must roster. Uh, upside... Probably not much higher than about top 90. I just think with that, that field goal percentage hurts him. The turnovers hurt him. But who cares about turnovers? Uh, yeah, look, I I, th- I think he's much roster the rest of the way. Upside, I think top 80 is probably best case. But pretty safely, I'd have him uh, around that top 100, top 110. I think... Yeah, yeah. Upside again. I, yeah, I don't know how much better he gets than what he is. Maybe the shooting stabilizes and becomes good. We still do have to factor in Cole Anthony and Markel Fultz when they come back, and that rotate is honestly a gigantic question mark. I don't think Suggs is moving to the bench. I don't think he's actually playing fewer than thirty minutes. But someone's going to play less, and somebody in that starting lineup is probably going to move to the bench or play less than the minutes they're getting. My guess is Bowl, but I don't know. Um, so I'd say Suggs is yes, you're right, must roster, and he is a guy to hold now, but. I'm not sure that he actually can get significantly significantly better than what he's doing now. He might, and that's just going to come from shooting, but that might get offset by ball handling responsibilities and usage dropping. Potentially, when those other guys do return, we'll come back for a couple more, or not for a couple more, a few more questions in a second. We'll get there really soon. But today's episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN, you know what it does. It protects your privacy and ensures your security online, but... There's something you might not know. You can also use ExpressVPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries. Maybe you've run out of stuff to watch on Netflix. That would mean you've watched a lot of Netflix, I'm guessing. ExpressVPN allows you to binge Rick and Morty from Australian Netflix. I didn't even know Rick and Morty was on Australian Netflix, but apparently it is. So if you've got ExpressVPN, you can fire it up, change your location to Australia, and go and watch Rick and Morty. It lets you control what sites or where you want sites to think you are. So you can choose from over 100 different countries. Imagine all those Netflix libraries that you can go through. It's not just Netflix. ExpressVPN works with any streaming service, Hulu, BBC, iPlayer, YouTube, you name it. There are hundreds of VPNs out there. But the reason for ExpressVPN is to watch shows because they're ridiculously fast. No buffering, no lag, and you can stream in HD, no problem. And it also works, ExpressVPN does, on all of your devices, phones, media consoles, smart TVs, and more. So if you want to get access to hundreds of new shows, go to expressvpn.com slash locked on right now, and you get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash locked on, expressvpn.com slash locked on to learn more. Let's go back and do questions. Kingy, let's see what has come up from people as I just try a million times to push buttons that don't work. Um, Denny Avdia. Andre says, is he a must roster? Again, this is... I'll let you talk about it in a second, Kingy, but 
to me, it's the, it's the, the chasing um, scenario. So what do you think about Denny? Oh, look, I think he's okay to have at the moment. If, if, you, if you want him, he's been pretty good. Um, but we've seen periods like this from him before. So I don't think he's must roster. I think he's fine to have, but I wouldn't sort of be overlooking or, or, or passing over a hot free agent to hold on to him. He's totally fine, right? He had that triple-double yesterday. So this is what I mean by chasing people. Go, oh, man, triple-double. Then you have the triple-double. Let's go. Let's go. But there's context behind it. He played 40 minutes. Bradley Beal was out. Monte Morris was out. Rui Hachimura was out. They're three guys who are going to play a lot of minutes. And in the case of Beal, take a lot of shots and take a lot of ball handling opportunities. In the case of Ball and Morris, like there's just too many factors there. So if Beal, Morris, and Hachimura remain out, I don't think they're long-term things at all. But if they remain out, then sure, grab Avdia. When they all play, then he becomes a streaming guy that might get you a steal and a block or might get you three assists and five rebounds and eight points or something. And I don't think that's must roster. So unless you have a time machine to go back and add him before yesterday, I'm not sure that you want to just scurry to go and grab him based on what just happened. That's not a repeatable performance. 40 minutes is not repeatable. The absence of those guys is not repeatable every single game. And while I do like Denny, and I think he's fitting that starting lineup is what exactly they need. That doesn't mean that he's going to have that level of opportunity in every game. In fact, he might not have it for another game all season. So just be really cautious about um, about looking at, at that value. Darius Nguyen says, "Miles Bridges, should I grab him? I'm in last place." Well, I've got I've got thoughts on this, King. What are you, what are your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are no. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, pretty much. I, yeah, I wouldn't. No. You're in last place, mate. So you're going to grab a guy that's A, not on a roster, not signed. And then when he does get on a roster and get signed, he's probably going to get suspended. So you're going to waste a roster spot while you wait for something to get resolved. And then when you wait for the second part of that to get resolved as well, that is a, if there was a way for you to go lower in the standings, that would be the way to do it. Don't grab him. There's no point in you grabbing him in last place. Again, he is not signed. He is not on a roster. And even if he does get signed and on a roster, then he's got to get conditioned and back to NBA game speed. And then he's got to deal with a suspension. I don't think he plays this season. So no, the only time I would consider it if you wanted to is if you're at the top of the stands, you know what? I've got a buffer, man. I'm killing these blokes. Maybe I can sit on Miles Bridges for a bit. I don't think he plays this season, but last place, absolutely the worst decision to make, I would think. Sorry. No, no offense to you, Darius, but you know, all in all offense. Um, this is a good question, and I don't know the answer, Kanye East, if that is your real name. What is the deal with Royce O'Neal's high assists this year? I, I don't know. I, it's out of nowhere. This is a bloke who's never, ever done this before. He's coming out regularly dropping six, seven, eight assists. I don't know what it is, King. I, I don't get it. Uh, no, I, I'm enjoying it. I've got him a few places, and, and I keep looking for reasons to drop him based on what we've seen the last couple of years, but he's not giving me any at the moment. He's getting assists. He's getting some defensive stats. He's hitting threes. Um, will he maintain it? I hope so, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't count on it. Yeah, exactly. Like, we have seen Royce O'Neal play for so long. He gets, like, what, two assists, and he has, like, 10% usage, and now he's at, like, 14 usage, and he's getting, like, six assists a game. It just it doesn't make a ton of sense when there's Kyrie and Ben Simmons and Kevin Durant out there as well. Um, but, yeah, with the way that he is playing maybe we have some level of faith in it. I don't know. I'm not ready to rule out that he's going to do this, but it also hasn't been all season that he's getting these five assists. It's been about the last week or two. Like it wasn't the first week. He was doing, he was doing all defensive stuff at the start of the season and that sort of dropped back off and now it's assists. He's been great. I still, yeah, I find it a little bit hard to look at that and go, yeah, that's what's going to keep happening. Um, all right. Let's have a look at some questions. Is Brandon Clark a clear drop, Stephen Bright says? Sadly, yes. Yeah, I think I think obviously. Like <laughs> he he is, right? Like we thought at the beginning of the preseason process, oh, Jaron's gonna be out, but they, they might start Clark and Adams, and then we got that indication that they wouldn't. So that just meant that yeah, that his value dropped then and they said, oh, I was way off on drafting a six. If you're not even gonna get that boost to begin the year as a starter, then what, what are we doing with him? Like, there's no real upside. And now he basically is exclusively a backup center to Stephen Adams. And there was some thought that maybe with Jaron back, they'd played less Adams and play less Clark. That didn't happen one game when Adams was in foul trouble, but it hasn't really been a pattern. Um, if someone gets hurt, then you're streaming, but I, I don't know what you're holding him for. I, yeah, to me, he is an... At- Look, you, you clear drop, I'm just going to assume standard. Or if you're talking 14 team leagues, then of course you want to hold. 16, no worries, you hold. 12s and 10s, like, see you later. No point in holding on to him. Um, 
Okay, I, I just, this is not a question that's been asked here, but it's sort of just taking in a bunch of things, King. I'm going to ask you, because people uh, ask me this all the time, and I think it's worth declaring our, our thoughts on, on this topic. Um, someone asked me today, hey, should I try and sell high on Damian Lillard? And my immediate reaction goes, like, what are you talking about? How could you possibly sell high on somebody who is not playing? Like, that's just not possible to do. People love trying to overreact to something that's happening now and then assume that it's going to have a different view or going to be looked through a different lens by somebody else. Like, there was also, like, another... I can't remember what it was, but it was someone who was really, you know, struggling and turned in, like, oh, Keldon Johnson, right, who's obviously playing horribly at the moment. And so, oh, man, I, I need to trade him away. Like, okay, but you've already absorbed, honestly, the worst games you could possibly absorb from him. It can't get any worse than that. So why are we, like this idea of sell high, buy low, people I think still get it confused, Kingy. So do you want to give them a definition of what we actually mean by that? Because someone who's out for two weeks, maybe longer, you're not selling them means this is the peak of their value. When someone is out for the second time with a calf injury, it is so far from the peak of their value that I think you're getting the, I think you're getting the term confused. Yeah. I think if, yeah, if if I, if I had Lillard, which, I'm not sure I do, but at the moment, if I was looking to trade him, it would be a buy low for someone else. I, I would think because he's out, he's it's the second time uh, you're concerned about his injury. So someone who is trying to sell him off would be selling him because he's not playing and they need production now. So you're not going to get a first round player back. You're going to get someone like a top 20 player back, uh, which, which is buying low. Um, Selling high would be someone like, uh, well, like a Royce O'Neill, who we, who we talked about there, is potentially a sell high because I'm not sure he can get any better. Uh, he's, I don't know what he's on the on the season top top eighty maybe top seventy. So you could sell him for a, for a top eighty player. I'd probably do it because I don't really see him getting any better. But then you also have to factor in the the name value and. Someone like Royce O'Neill isn't a, a guy that people are chasing because he's never, as we touched on, he's never done this before. So with guys like that, you really just have to hold on and enjoy what they're doing. Um, it is, yeah, it is a term that gets thrown around a lot, obviously, with with players who are playing really well or players who are injured or someone like a Keegan Murray um, and, and his lack of production at the moment. So, yeah, I think people do get confused, though, as you said. I think one, yeah, one of the things that I, that I talk about a lot is about um, you know being really cautious with trades and having your first reaction to trades being no, I'm not going to do this trade. That's not to say don't trade. That's just to say have a negative a negative view on a trade and be ready to f- convince yourself to do it, not try and talk yourself out of it. Um, and the same thing goes with pickups and buy lows and sell highs. Like remember this point: you do not have a time machine, right? You cannot go back in time to you know trade a guy away because he played poorly the last three games. You can't go back and erase those three games that you had. You can't go and, yeah, I'm going to pick up Terrence Davis because last game he shot 80% and yeah, scored 20 points in 29 minutes. So that's great. He's definitely going to do that again, isn't he? Well, no, he's not. Like you don't have time machines to be able to go back in time and yeah, make your moves based on what has already happened when there's no real pattern for that happening in the future. And I think that's really, really important. And people, it is hard sometimes to get it out of your head. They're like, I just saw this. So therefore, this is what's going to happen every game as we move forward. And then your yeah, buy lows and sell highs understand that the buy low doesn't mean you have to get rid of, you have to you have to get this guy in or a sell high doesn't mean you have to get rid of this player. It's about, hey, do I get value? If not, like, well, who cares? Just stick with it. Let's go. Um. And then I get questions like this. Brian Wade said, what's up with Michael Porter Jr.? Like, absolutely nothing. What, what, what does that mean? Again, the, and this is how trades can happen to be your advantage. Because I just think of what Michael Porter Jr. is doing and going, oh, he's been fine. Like, we picked him in maybe the 70s. He's producing that value. I see nothing to say, man, he's completely blowing up that value or he's completely underperforming it. But someone obviously thinks that he's not producing to the value that we're expecting. So you can make deals based on that. I, Brian, I have absolutely no idea what you're referencing there. Unless I'm missing something, King. Has he been particularly horrible that I haven't really noticed? Oh, no. Look, I mean, he's, he's, things have, have dropped off a little bit over the last couple of weeks. Um, I think he's outside the top 150, but he's top 70 on the season, which is right where we drafted him. Um, no play, Well, with the exception of a couple of guys, no player is going to put up consistent value every game all season long there's going to be ups and downs uh and and this is a little bit of a down period but it's 
it's not like he's destroying you and playing so bad that he's causing you to lose matchups and that sort of thing. So what's up with him? Yeah, I mean, it's it's he's struggled a little bit, but he'll turn it around and he'll put up top 40 value for a week at some point. He will. We'll get back to more questions in just a second. But today's episode is also brought to you by Sweatblock. Jennifer, my old mate, she used to wear multiple shirts and fold toilet paper in her armpits to try and hide the embarrassing sweat. Kingy, I'm going to guess you'd never been a big toilet paper in the armpit sort of guy. I'm not. I do sweat a lot, but I, I've you never haven't... gone down the, the path of toilet paper. And how many shirts would you say is the maximum that you've worn to prevent your sweat getting through? Oh, I would say three. Let's go three. Three. So, okay, so <laughs> three shirt Kingy over here is not doing the toilet paper out like Jennifer, but he is going multiple shirts because a, as we know, like that is the only way. And I'm being told it's not the only way to prevent sweating. Kingy, you're going to love this because you're not going to need to buy as many shirts and you're not going to have as big of a, a washing load as you're going through you know, 25 shirts during the week because Sweatblock is here. Sweatblock wipes have been a bestseller on Amazon for the past 10 years with over 10,000 five-star reviews. Don't miss this opportunity to try Sweatblock. Big shirt and big toilet paper hate Sweatblock because it means their sales go right down. But that's what Sweatblock's here for, to disrupt those industries, to tell you you do not need three shirts every day. You do not need to put toilet paper not in your toilet paper zones. Use them for their intended purposes. One shirt, toilet paper down the bottom, and that's it. Sweatblock will cover the rest. So if you or someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweater odor, try Sweatblock. Save 20% with the promo code locked on at sweatblock.com. Also available on Amazon. Jenny, get some. Kingy, get some. All right, let's go back to questions. Love a sweat block ad. Um, all right. So Tony says, how many sponsors can you say your ad reads have lost for Locked On Networks? Zero. None. They love them. Why, why would they, why my ad reads lose them? They, they love it. No chance. Um, all right, Samuel Desta. Does Wendell Carter Jr.'s plantar fascia concern you rest of season Adam King uh, I, it's maybe a little bit uh, I'm not making any moves based on what we know at the moment um, it's yeah I mean given the magic aren't they're not playing for anything other than lottery picks um, uh, maybe maybe a fraction uh, but as I said not making any moves at the moment Um I'll wait to see, but plan of, they can be tricky. They can be injuries that players play through, but they need a bit of maintenance. Um, we've seen them linger. I mean, the the only thing you can really do for a plantar fascia, if it's not a tear, is, is just a bit of rest, a bit of management. So, and the rest takes a while as well. Like to actually get it healed, yeah. it's like a multi-month rest thing. And mm. I think what the risk there to me with Carter is, I'm, I am worried a little bit, obviously. He's playing through it. But what to me that means is that if you want to talk shutdowns, is that he might just get an extra month's rest by by sitting in March. I think think that is a possibility if it doesn't improve. The way to heal a plantar fascia injury faster is to tear it. And I know that sounds counterintuitive. I'm sure you've heard the stories before of Kingy, of people having plantar fascia issues and it just the pain won't go away, so they deliberately tear it to try and get it done. I've heard these stories of people like, I'm going to jump, get up high on my roof, jump on the ground, try and land flat-footed so it completely tears so I can get healed and get back in a month rather than have to deal with pain for four months or whatever. Um, which seems a little extreme. But that's sometimes what people people do to try and get that to, to heal. So I think what it does mean is that there is a risk of Carter maybe ending his season early um, once we hit March or April just to try and get those extra few weeks of rest in if it doesn't improve from there. But I'm not like panicking thinking he's going to start missing you know, swathes of games uh, from now. I don't think. LSW. What do you think about Dennis Schroeder? Oh... I, I haven't added him anywhere. Um, he could, I mean, Pat Beverly's out for three games now, so he could get some extra minutes. Uh, but Austin Reeves has been playing really well. They've still got Westbrook coming off the bench. Um, oh, look, I think, I mean, best case, I think if everything went perfectly for him, he's probably a top 140, 130 guy. So there's not, I don't think there's enough upside there to be adding him and, and holding him for two weeks while he ramps back up. 100% agree. He is not very good. I think that's the number one thing. He's not very good. And in order to be a good fantasy contributor, he needs 30 plus minutes, not getting them. He needs good usage, not really getting it with Davis, LeBron and Westbrook there. He needs to be the guy that's orchestrating the office, uh, off offense, not happening. 
right? These things aren't, aren't happening. Yes, if LeBron and Davis are out or Davis and Westbrook are out or LeBron and Westbrook are out and it's him and one of those other guys there, then sure, let's go for it, right? But he's not good enough. He's not a guy that can shoot well. He's not a guy that's going to rack up big rebounds and big defensive stats or is going to get uh, Royce O'Neal level of assists or anything like that unless he is orchestrating an offense. And if he's orchestrating an offense, well, then you're tanking for the number one pick and they don't have the number one pick. He's just not very good. And I know he has name value for some reason. I don't know why people love this bloke. He His last good season was with the Thunder. Um, yeah, two, three years ago where he's playing 30 plus minutes and it was him and Chris Paul sort of staggering. Shea really was playing off ball that entire time and Shea wasn't Shea who, who Shea is now. Um, but there's three guys who have got better, better usage than him. And then there's Lonnie Walker and then there is Pat Beverly and there is Austin Reeves and there is these other guys that they just throw in there. So, I mean, sure, take a fly for these three games with Beverly out. I, I, even if he plays 30 minutes next to LeBron and Davis and with Westbrook crossing over, I don't think he's going to do enough. I don't think he's good enough to do it. So I think it will probably end up being a waste. There you go. Yeah, and I, I just pulled up his numbers in that season you're referencing there where he, with OKC where he played 31 minutes, 19 points a game. He was the 115th ranked player. So mm-hmm. there you go. David says, is Isaiah Jackson a must hold with Turner might not even get traded? Um, go, Kingy. Oh, no, I don't think so. Um I, I wish he was, but the, much like the Kings, the paces look pretty good. I think they, they want to compete. Uh, they're better than probably they thought they'd be. Uh, and Turner looks really good. I've seen a few stats and a few tweets on how much better they are with him on the floor uh, and their their winning percentage and, and all sorts of things. So, yeah, I, I don't think so. He's more of a luxury stash kind of guy for me. Uh, that's exactly what he is. So when you phrase the question, David, is he a must hold? 100% no, he is not a must hold because as I will say, until like until I blow up from holding my breath, like just assume a trade's not happening. Like you'll be right 90% of the time. And we, how often have we heard Miles Turner's getting traded? But it is the last year of Turner's contract. Pacers guys seem to think he would get traded, but they also thought this would be one of the worst teams in the NBA, not a team that's sitting fifth in the East or wherever they currently are with Miles Turner absolutely dominating. Um, so no, he's not a must hold. He's a luxury hold. If you're in a solid position, we've got the ability to hold someone on your roster. You're not dealing with multiple injuries and you're waiting and waiting. Cause this is a top 50 upside player when that hits. And there's not many of those guys that are sitting around that you can consider holding, but there's still like a less than 50% chance that he ever gets there. And that just is going to require you to have patience or have a well-constructed roster to be able to absorb that. So must hold, of course, absolutely no way. Um, People get so fired up about stuff. I know I'm, I'm fired up now, but I posted yesterday after Miles Turner's big game saying, man, what a huge game from Turner. He's dominating. Um, do you guys think he'll get traded? And someone responded back, man, just because he have a, has a big trade, now you think that he's going to get traded as if people would just trade him trade after one big game. That's not how the NBA works. What are you talking about? Like, mate, settle down. Like, what are you talking about? That's just... Anyway, Miles Turner's great. I've liked Miles Turner for a long time and... He is actually showing it that he uh, can put together some big performances, and we're seeing that now. Um, all right, I haven't read this, Herod Marathi, but I'm interested in it. He who shall not be named is reportedly saying that he can play 10 minutes right now, but he wants to be able to play 20 to 25. Do you call BS on this rationale? Everything and I'm going to say his name because Kingy might not know who I'm talking about here. I know who you. Uh, you do. Everything that bloke says is bullshit. Like, uh, he, I can't, I can't believe anything that he says. Like, all, all right, mate, Mister ACL takes me three years to recover from. Hey, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna play now. Look, I'm, I swear, my girlfriend, she lives in Canada. I'm not gonna play now. I'm just gonna wait until I can play 20 minutes. Then you'll see everything. It'll be great. I'll be, I'll be amazing. I'll be the best player I've ever seen. I'll be out there dominating. But I can only do it when I can play 25. Like, get out of here, you dickhead. What are you talking about? I could, play, I could play 10 now, but I'm just choosing not to. All right, you've chosen not to play for two years. Anyway, this annoys me because just give me some transparency on what the hell is going on because this is not normal. This recovery is far from normal. You're being cautious. You're not being cautious. You're being ridiculous. This is not, this, there's been a setback or there's something else going on. Simple as that. This is not a standard recovery. So don't play me with this bullshit of, I, I have, wait till I play 25 minutes. All right, man. Good on you. Play 25 minutes. Do it in China. No offense to the Chinese league, but Jesus Christ. Anyway, that's bullshit. Um, question for Kingy: Would you watch Josh Cook? <laughs> watch Josh Cook. Depends what he's cooking. Uh, yeah, if he's cooking something for me that I like, then I would. Mate, you would have loved it last night. Date and soy glazed beef short rib. Oh, it was a bloody cracker. Yeah, bloody, it was so good. I slid straight off the bone. Nice, slightly sweet. 
salty s- sauce with the with the soy, the dates in there, they melted in. Oh, mate, it was an absolute crack. It took about five hours to make, but it was really yeah. good. Really uh, good. It's a lot, a lot fancier than what I had for dinner last night. What did you have for dinner? Uh, we, my son plays Dungeons and Dragons on a Thursday, oh, so yeah. it's always a quick dinner. So I just, I just whipped up a really big chunky omelet. An omelet? Well, yeah. People who listen to this podcast know I'm not an egg guy, so that sounds pretty disgusting to me. <laughs> but actually, looking at an omelet, they look nice. I just can't eggs. I just can't do it with eggs. Anyway, Bob Stone, what's up with Pirtle's assist numbers? Uh, I. I don't know. Is he getting more assists? He's another guy I don't have. He probably yeah. He probably, is. Oh, look, he, he's always he's always had a, a sneaky ability to get assists, a bit like a Stephen Adams. Um, oh, he's better than that, I think. Better than better than that, but but one of those big guys that you can run the offense through um, at a pinch, and and the the Spurs don't really have. I mean, they've got Trey Jones, but they don't have a lot of point guard or, or true point guard options. So why not use Pirtle? Um So. Oh, no, I'll, I think he can probably be a, a three to four assist guy most nights. You hit uh, the key part of that. They're running the offense through him. Trey Jones is fine, but everything is running through Pirtle. I don't have the numbers and I can go and get them, but I'm pretty sure if you look at like you know, post touches and passes per game, like he's one of the top guys in the NBA of just, he's working like a Sabonis and Jokic, but the assists aren't quite as high as those guys, but they run everything through him. He gets it at the elbow and everyone sort of splits and then he distributes. doesn't always lead to assists, but the reason the assists are high is because they are running things through him as that guides him. And it's Vassell and Jones who are the real key orchestrators and passing. You see Vassell's numbers way up as well. And a lot of the Spurs offense, because they lack the top end individual talent, they're doing it through scheme. That's why all their assists, like Vassell's numbers are high. Pirtle's numbers are high. Even Trey Jones' assists are high. And the team's assist numbers as a general rule, I'm pretty sure, are pretty high because of the way they're running things. So that he is like a fulcrum to that offense. They give it to him and then just sort of spread and let him run things because his decision-making and passing is really strong. We haven't really seen that in the past um, because they had DeJounte Murray. Then before that, they had uh, DeMar DeRozan, who was that guy. But now it's Pirtle, who they're trusting with his decision-making. And that's what's leading to the increase in assists. Kingy, that is 30 minutes for us done. Thank you for coming on and answering people's questions on this Thanksgiving Thursday in the States. Tell people uh, what you've got cracking. Uh, we've just got our, our uh, FBI shows going. Um, B-Dub and I are doing a weekly show. I'm doing a weekly show. Um, so, re- yeah, really just enjoying the basketball. One question that I keep meaning to message you, but I forget. I'd love to hear the Greg sound drop on a show at some point. I know it's hard because there's no Greg there's players. No Greg. That are, there's Greg Brown, but He's, anyway. he's in the G League. Uh, is this, I'm trying to work out whether this is it. I think it is. As Greg runs in, we realise I won't be this able to could hear. get I can't dangerous. Hear it, but I'll, I'll try. It's the Greg runs in one. Yeah, you can't hear it, but I did just play it. So just yeah, pause, p- pause for three seconds, and I'll play it again, and we'll just let it run so you can hear it perfectly. All right. As Greg runs in, we realise this could get dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, it did get dangerous. There you go, Kingy. So you can go back and watch that. You can hear the Greg sound drop, and uh, hopefully that makes your Friday and it makes your whole week. Guys, follow Adam at AdamKing91. Um, thanks, mate. Thanks for jumping on. And that'll do it for us today, guys. Don't forget to follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Odyssey, and on YouTube. You know what to do. Hit a thumbs up if you're watching live. But even if you're not watching live, hit a thumbs up. Drop your comments down below, guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.